So I discuss uh, a series of individuals and groups, organizations behind this, bloggers, uh, political pundits, politicians, religious leaders, and what I do is I seek to show the ways in which they're connected, um, how they operate, uh, that is, how they generate fear about Islam and about Muslims, um, where they get their money from, and why this is important. Um, so that's just sort of a very brief and, and general um, summary of the book. Um, what sort of led me to this, though, was this idea that um, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, 59% of Americans reported that they had a generally positive image of Islam. And that was quite strange to me because you would think that in the immediate aftermath of an attack like that, it would be um, maybe reasonable and logical and even appropriate to ask sort of uncomfortable questions. Um, who are these individuals that attacked us? Why did they do it in the name of their religion? And what is it about their religion that encouraged them to interpret it so violently. Uh, but we see that just sort of the opposite was true. I mean, nearly 60% of the population said that they had a generally positive image of Islam. The strange thing is, though, that 11 years later, uh, 11 years later, polls show a complete flip. So more than half of the population now says that they um, are made uncomfortable by Muslims, that Muslims make them feel uncomfortable, that they would be uncomfortable if their child had a Muslim school teacher. They would be uncomfortable if they sat next to a Muslim on an airplane. They would be uncomfortable if they saw um, a Muslim man praying in an airport. So the same percentage uh, now suggests that American values are incompatible with Islamic values. And so it's, it's sort of that, um, that that drove this, this interest of mine and sort of led me to speculate about why such a thing uh, it, you know, exists. Why do, we, why do we see more than a decade later that people are so riled up and anxious and excited about uh, the presence of Muslims in our society, which is a perfectly normal and wonderful thing? Look, we've seen this monster before, um, you know, and... and we, we've seen it with, uh, you know, the Red Scare, uh, people freaking out over um, the supposed takeover of the United States by communists, right, during the Cold War. We saw this during the 1950s and 60s, and sadly, even still today, with racism against African Americans. We've seen this with anti-Semitism directed at Jews. Um, the, the sad reality that is that um, Americans thrive on um, these types of scares, these types of monsters. And in fact, in the first chapter of my book, which is titled Historical Monsters, I discuss this. And I discuss how Muslims are um, the, you know, the unfortunate victims of this racism du jour, right? It's, it's the racism uh, of the day. And um, so, yes, this is sort of a you know, a thing that has, has followed the arc of history and is very much in line with racism and anti-Semitism um, and, you know, even, even um, fears over uh, Catholics, right? I mean, uh, the election of John Kennedy uh, was a really big deal because people were flipping out that, you know, that a Catholic would be elected president and that would mean that the Pope would basically take over the country and the Vatican would rule and we know that that didn't happen. Uh, uh, and so, you know, in, in that regard, it is the same. The, the way that I would say that it is different is that today there is more of an invested interest in the people who promote this type of stuff. You see um, an industry, as I discuss in the book, of people who um, spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money to actively whip the population into a frenzy over the presence of Muslims. And this may be something that we didn't necessarily see with, you know, the civil rights era, that we didn't see with anti-Semitism, that we didn't see with, you know, other epi episodes of prejudice in the country. So I think in that regard, it is different. Um, but certainly this strain of xenophobia is um, very much in line with the rest. It, it certainly stems from that same lineage. There's, there's no doubt that the, that the media plays a role. Uh, I discussed that in, in some detail in the book. But I think also, you know, one of the things that has really been behind a lot of this recent Islamophobia 
is uh, the blogosphere and the social media outlets because the reality is this is where a lot of folks get their news. Um, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, we have these sort of 30 second headlines on cable news, people are so glued to their iPhones and their iPads and their laptops that, you know, we often receive our news in 140 character tweets, right? Uh, we often receive our news through our friends' Facebook status uh, updates. And if you are a part of this right wing clique, that harbors this hatred and ill will toward Muslims, this type of thing uh, spreads like a cancer. And it really is a social cancer. Um, you know, the, the whole hue and cry over the Park 51 Islamic Community Center uh, is a perfect example of that. Pamela Geller, a uh, ultra-conservative right-wing Zionist blogger in New York, um, really single-handedly uh, manufactured the fear over that um, so-called Ground Zero mosque. Um, she penned an article on her blog that overnight really went viral and suddenly spread. So, you know, whereas you had this Park 51 Islamic Community Center, no one was referring to it as that. And you even got to a point at, at one time where mainstream news media were referring to this Islamic Center as the Ground Zero mosque because it was so easy to repeat. It uh, conjured up images of, you know, Ground Zero. It sort of had an emotive element to it that um, harkened back to the days of that tragedy. Uh, and so we say Ground Zero Mosque, and everyone knows what we're talking about. Uh, you know, the reality of that, which of course we know, is that uh, it wasn't a mosque. It wasn't at Ground Zero. It was a uh, sort of a sneaky way for Pamela Geller and the Islamophobia industry of which she's a part to dominate the narrative and to manipulate the way that people talked about that uh, that episode that episode in our history and that that instance where this you know Islamic community center was trying to sort of come to the fore and be built and it was used as a way also to attack the proponents uh, of that center and you know so you have the ground zero mosque right which then joined the um, the litany, really, of other right-wing memes. You know, we have terror babies, right? Uh, babies that uh, are born in the United States to Muslim parents who are supposedly going to go back to their Muslim-majority country to grow up and be trained as terrorists. But because they're American citizens, they're going to come back to the United States eventually and take over the United States from the inside. So you have these sort of frightening phrases like that, terror babies, ground zero mosques, death panels, you know. Um, Obamacare, all of these things come from the same people. So, um, in that regard, it is really uh, you know interesting to see how the internet sort of fosters this uh, you know this narrative that's controlled by these people who manipulate the ways that we talk and think about Muslims and Islam. You know, I think that um, the election years provide um, opportunities for people in the Islamophobia industry. Um, but it is important to point out that the people who work in this industry and comprise this industry are drumming up anti-Muslim sentiment, whether it's an election year or not. Uh, they've been doing this for a long time. Um, Daniel Pipes has been doing it since the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, but a lot of these new figures that I've discussed um, sort of emerged right after 2001, taking advantage, of course, uh, and exploiting the tragedy of September the 11th uh, to their advantage. The thing about election seasons, though, is it provides an amplified platform. People are watching the news more closely. People's anxieties and tensions and aggravations and frustrations about the world, whether they're economic, whether they're social, whether they're political, uh, are, are sort of, you know, at the fore. Uh, and so the Islamophobia industry knows that, and they take advantage of that too. I mean, the people that comprise the Islamophobia industry are opportunists uh, par excellence. Uh, these are individuals who know how to manipulate narratives, who know how to tap into the psyche of the population at the um, opportune um moment. So, you know, the thing about it is, uh, if, if we look at 
you know, 2008, right, with the election of Barack Obama, we see that there was sort of a spike in, uh, you know, anti-Muslim prejudice and anti-Muslim sentiment. We saw, you know, accusations being thrown around about Barack Obama being a Muslim, as if that was a bad thing. Uh, the people who were throwing around these accusations suggested that it was. We have people like Frank Gaff, who is a prominent member of the Islamophobia industry, who advises Michelle Bachman, who recently made a fool of herself uh, with claims that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's chief, deputy chief of staff was a secret member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Frank Gaffney uh, threw around claims during 2008 that you know, Barack Obama was a secret member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, you know, a lot of this uh, stems from, uh, you know, the fact that this, you know, sort of left of center presidential candidate may be elected. Yes, um, a lot of it also comes from the fact that the presidential candidate, the current president, and uh, potentially the, um, the re-election uh, or the candidate, the president who will be re-elected, uh, is an African American, so you know it's it's a thing that a lot of people don't want to say, but we see it again. Um, you know, this year we saw it in the midterm elections, um, and we know because statistics tell us that the majority of the people who harbor this anti-Muslim sentiment are uh, Republicans, right? We just saw a poll released by the Arab uh, American Institute, which suggested that fifty-seven percent of uh, Republicans uh, harbor prejudice uh, towards Muslims. They're uncomfortable with the presence of Muslims in our society. Uh, and you know, we also know that 17% um, of uh, the electorate uh, this year uh, feels the same way. And so, you know, those things have catastrophic uh, consequences because we see uh, over the course of this summer, leading up to the elections in the fall, all sorts of um, nasty and deadly and hateful um, episodes of violence, not only directed at Muslims, but also directed at other ethnic and religious minorities. The shooting in the Sikh temple, uh, you know, was, was uh, you know, an example of that. I mean, the individual, uh, Wade Michael Page, had carried out. Uh, likely didn't know the difference between Sikhs and Muslims. For him, these individuals had darker skin, they wore uh, turbans, maybe they had beards, maybe their names were funny. Uh, and for him, that was enough to go into a temple and shoot and kill them. Um, you know, we see um, some of the instances that, that we've talked about during this interview uh, sort of spike over the course of the summer. So yes, election years, uh, to sort of sum up, do... Um, you know, affect um, the way that individuals react towards the Muslim communities. They, they do allow the Islamophobia industry to sort of have an elevated uh, platform, a more pronounced platform. Um, and all of that is very dangerous. I, I really would like to thank uh, you and Aslan Media for having this interview. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I encourage those who are at home uh, watching to go out and buy you can follow one of the links, uh, I'm sure, below uh, to get it. You can check it out on Amazon. You can check out my webpage, www.nathanlean.com. Uh, to, to leave you with a, a sort of parting word, I, I want to emphasize that uh, Muslims and Islam should not be feared. Um, nor should mosques, minarets, veils, prayer beads, or other symbols of uh, the Islamic faith. Well, what should be feared, though, is the band of right-wing hucksters who make a living pet hatred of others, and whose determination to discriminate against a minority population and turn ordinary Americans against them uh, is really ripping apart the pluralistic fabric of America.